This is WRAL News at 7 with special coverage of coronavirus. Facts, not fear. As we close out another week of the pandemic, a roadmap to reopening North Carolina and efforts to expand testing leads to a partnership with local universities. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Gerald Owens. And I'm David Crabtree. Let's begin with a look at the cases. The largest one day rise thus far in the pandemic in North Carolina, up 590 cases in 24 hours. We passed 6,000 confirmed cases today, 180 deaths, a number that has more than doubled over the past week. 429 are in the hospital. Some other headlines from across the state today. Two confirmed deaths at Fort Bragg, a civilian employee and a contractor. This marks the first coronavirus related deaths on post. There are at least 281 confirmed cases at the News Correctional Institution, where all 700 inmates and staff members were tested earlier this week. Most of the people are showing no symptoms. Today, the governor announced a new partnership between the state and three medical universities, Duke, North Carolina, and East Carolina. This is an effort to ramp up testing. We also learned that a sixth resident at a Lewisburg nursing center has died. The facility is one of four nursing homes in our area with numerous deaths. I'm Mark Boyle in the Live Center tonight. Within the past 30 minutes, Durham City leaders announcing effective on Monday. While in public, you'll have to wear one of these, a mask. So when that's grocery shopping, you'll have to wear a mask. When you're out pumping gas, you'll have to wear a mask. And Mark Anthony Middleton is a city council member who just talked to me on the phone about 15 minutes ago about policing this, and he believes everyone will get on board. Take a listen. As with all things, none of this stuff was ever intended to be a, a hyper enforcement type thing where we've got police stopping people and doing spot checks. You know, this is Durham, so we 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 uh, we work on a lot of peer pressure. Uh, I know this. We you know we're very good at encouraging one another to maintain social distancing, and we expect the same type of cooperation and adherence uh, that we've seen in social distancing with the face mask. And the councilman tells me already most people, in fact, are wearing these just to protect themselves during this outbreak. Back to you. Thank you, Mark. Also happening right now, the daily update from the president and the coronavirus task force. The president just announced $19 billion in aid for farmers hurt by this pandemic. We'll have more updates from that news conference, which is going on right now, coming up in just a few minutes. The unemployment application process in North Carolina should get, a smooth, should get smoother over the next several days. Leaders say the number of workers processing claims should be tripled by the end of next week, with as many as 1,600 staff members working to expedite the process. We know what needs to be done to reopen the state, testing, tracing, and trends. The timing of all this, however, remains unclear, very unclear. WREL's Joe Fisher now with the governor's concerns and the research being done to help reopen North Carolina. Today, Governor Cooper announced a new group that will work to identify new ways to increase testing. That's so they can try to figure out exactly how many people are infected before they lift any restrictions. Behind me on Glenwood South, you're looking at the result of this stay at home order. Many businesses remain closed. We talked to some, though, who say it still might be too early to reopen. Even with this roadside stand, the loss in profits continues to climb. I don't even want to add up everything. But the owner of Clyde Cooper's Barbecue says the price of reopening would be worse. A relapse is a relapse, and that's not out of the question for this situation. Today, Governor Roy Cooper said before relaxing restrictions, the state needs more testing and needs to prove that more severely sick patients are leaving the hospital. We want those trends to be headed down so that North Carolinians can restore their lives and their livelihoods. I think we can keep it at bay. If we take it slow and we take it steady, we use data. Dr. Aaron McKeithen is part of a team of researchers working to inform the governor's decisions. He says the data shows social distancing is working, but efforts to reopen must be done slowly to protect thousands of people who are unknowingly infected. Like compound interest, right? This infection, uh, the, the virus itself uh, spreads very quickly. Uh, and um, and can very quickly take what looks like a sustainable and manageable hospital census uh, and, and get into trouble pretty quickly, particularly in parts of the state that are hotspots. 
Governor Cooper not ruling out the possibility of easing restrictions by region. Still, businesses like Clyde Cooper's Barbecue are worried about a slow rebound. How many people are going to come? out and patronize us so they have their own fear and here we are paying a light bill a mortgage water employees and people don't come McKeithen says that his team believes the first peak in North Carolina will happen in mid-May or early June. One sobering thought he adds is that each time these restrictions are lifted, more people will be infected, more people will be hospitalized, and sadly, more people will die. It's the price, he says, for this path forward. Back to you. Joe, thank you. Like compound interest. Coming up in the next 10 minutes, Senator Tom Tillis will explain his new role and the attempt to reopen the states. Some communities along the coast are beginning to reopen while others remain closed. Today, dozens of people gathered in Carolina Beach, asking authorities to reopen. The rally ended at the Carolina Beach Town Hall. This group wants businesses and the beach to reopen while following CDC guidelines. Those who oppose reopening it believe that this could make things worse. Wake County School Superintendent Kathy Moore is happy with how things are going as students wrap up their first week of online learning. The district continues to push computers and internet access out to every family. Moore says in some schools, participation online is about 75% and others about 50%. While they say those numbers are better than the national average, Board Chair Keith Sutton says they want them to climb. We realize there are still large gaps in terms of equitable access to learning. Those gaps are completely unacceptable, and sadly, they are not unique to Wake County. And the discussions continue on just how lost school time might be made up in the future, including summer school or an early start next year. Surplus chicken sales will continue over the weekend and into next week. Sky 5 flew over several locations this morning with people trying to score some great prices, as little as 87 cents a pound. House of Rayford Farms has been selling its surplus meat to recoup sales lost from food retailers that were forced to shut down or limit services during the pandemic. Now, this will go on for a few more days at different locations across central and eastern North Carolina. We have a list of them on WRAL.com. In the midst of this coronavirus outbreak, 70 families have found out their children may have been exposed to lead. This happened at two schools in downtown Raleigh, Beginnings and Beyond Child Development Center and Sacred Heart Cathedral. The officials say the children may have been exposed to lead dust. They want those 70 children to get a blood test at their doctor's office, but still practice social distancing. Wake County says Sacred Heart has already completed special cleaning. From IRS frustrations to stimulus checks, we take your concerns straight to Senator Tom Tillis. My conversation with him and more on his new role in helping North Carolina reopen. That's coming up next. Kat. And it has been such a beautiful Friday afternoon, but clouds are starting to move in ahead of our next system this weekend. I'll show you your weekend forecast coming up next. This is WRAL News special coverage. Facts, not fear. One of the members of the president's bipartisan congressional task force to determine how and when to reopen the economy is North Carolina Senator Tom Tillis. He's joining us via Zoom. Senator, thank you as always for taking the time. Walk us through this group and the conversations you've begun to have. Well, the, the president, he's creating a business group that's separate from the congressional task force that he asked me to be a part of. We had a conference call with the president and uh, the vice president and some members of the COVID task force yesterday. And the idea is for us to begin to refine the concept of what a safe restart would look like with an eye towards potentially opening some businesses as early as the first part of May. The way that we'll do that is to use data that give us a reasonable degree of confidence that there are certain counties or regions of uh, states or entire states that could potentially open up as long as we're maintaining a, a positive trend for the uh, spread of the virus. Senator, the stimulus checks rolled out this week. Our newsroom, our front desk, I'm sure your office inundated with people calling, dealing with issues on the IRS website, whether it's updating its account information, determining eligibility, money may be in the account, not in the account. This was a huge endeavor. So what's your message to them other than patience? 
Well, I, I, you took the words right out of my mouth, Dave. I mean, if you take a look at, uh, we're hearing the same kinds of reports from the Department of Employment Security, the Unemployment Office in North Carolina. We're dealing with a scale that's unprecedented. We're talking about 80 to 90 million bank account credits that have to get out. So even if you have a one half of 1% uh, error rate, that's millions of people affected. In the same way that the unemployment office, the Department of Unemployment Secu or Employment Security, is dealing with nearly 600,000 requests over a period of time, they would expect to get maybe 15,000. So we have to exercise patience, but we've also got to be persistent. Going out to the IRS website, checking the status of your check. We've heard some reports of the wrong accounts being credited; those have to be reversed. We've just got to work on this together. We're doing everything we can, but when you're talking about 150 to 160 million Americans potentially receiving assistance mm -hmm. through the individual assistance alone, we're going to have to work out a few problems along the way. And people are working seven days a week doing that. The last time we talked to you, we were talking about small businesses. Again, that program, you said, had to work out the glitches. Well, this week, the money ran out from the initial installments there. You've been very vocal about the latest plan to approve more money. So where does that stand? And if you're a small business owner and you haven't had assistance yet, what do you say? Well, what I would say to them is right now we're dealing with an unforced error. Speaker Pelosi and Chuck Schumer have refused to backfill with $250 billion, a program that they voted for unanimously for $350 billion. So we simply need a straight up or down vote to authorize the Treasury to have an additional $250 billion. It's got to be heartbreaking for somebody who went into a bank yesterday fully expecting to be able to get a loan, having all the paperwork together, only to be told by their banker they can't underwrite the loan because the federal government, the Treasury, says they no longer have any resources. This can be fixed with a simple agreement on the Senate floor if Chuck Schumer will allow it. We tried to do it last week ahead of it because we knew that we were going to need additional resources, and we need to do it today. Do you think we'll get it anytime soon? I hope so. I think that if, uh, if Speaker Pelosi takes a look at her state of California and the thousands of businesses that are hanging in the balance, or Chuck Schumer in the state of, of, of New York, uh, we're seeing increasing numbers of uh, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle voicing their support for moving forward with the straight up vote. And hopefully we'll get that. We can have a discussion about what more we need to do. There is more that Congress will have to act on when we return in May. But we should not hold up a program that was unanimously supported while people try to put forward other priorities that we can discuss the merits of when we return in May. Senator, very quickly before we let you go, Speaking of May, earlier you said by May 1st, they could see some movement with reopening. Is that a realistic date as you look at things today? Well, Dave, in Wake County or Mecklenburg County, uh, probably not. Not of the scale that we may be able to look at in other counties that have had a handful of cases reported. As long as we think that the spread of the virus has been contained or the risk of spread is relatively low, and that we have the capacity in the healthcare systems in certain areas, then why not look at a safe restart? Look, it's not gonna be like it was in February where you've got mass gatherings mm -hmm. and you have uh, uh, bars and, and other places where, uh, uh, where it's simply not safe to have people get together yet. But there are a lot of opportunities for businesses to open if they open safely and they conform to guidelines that would be put forth by the governor and consistent with the guidelines coming out of the administration. We've got to look for that because the only way we ultimately heal our economy is first, make sure public health is preserved, but secondly, get people back to work. North Carolina Senator Tom Tillis, as always, Senator, thanks for your time. Best to you. Thank you, Dave. Have a great weekend. I'm Mark Boyle in the live center right now. Some of the highlights coming out of the president's COVID-19 task force update this afternoon that's still going on right now is a lot of money funding for farmers across America. So that's one thing that was discussed 
And he left and then Vice President Mike Pence came in and talked about testing and saying that there should be enough tests out there for phase one to begin soon across the country. Of course, we know that opening up the states now is in the governor's hands. Happening right now, Dr. Burks is speaking from the podium in Washington, D.C. But let's go back to Mike, Mike Pence, the vice president, talking about testing. Here's what he had to say just a few minutes ago. Our best scientists and health experts assess that today we have a sufficient amount of testing to meet the requirements of a phase one reopening if state governors should choose to do that. We'll continue to monitor the briefing, bring you any highlights here during our 7 o'clock news. And then if you'd like to watch this in its entirety right now, you can on WRAL2 and online on WRAL.com. Thank you, Mark. Some of the most popular musicians and artists are coming together tomorrow night to help fight the coronavirus. One World Together at Home airs tomorrow night at 8 o'clock right here on WRAL. The goal is to celebrate the heroic efforts of health care workers and support the World Health Organization. The event includes performances by Billie Eilish, Chris Martin, Elton John, and Stevie Wonder, just to name a few. Coming up next on WRAL, reporting on the front lines of the crisis, we check in with former WRAL reporter Dan Bowens, who now works in the nation's hotspot, New York City. This is WRAL News special coverage, facts, not fear. Back now on WRL, you're taking a live look at downtown Wake Forest. You see just a few cars parked there. I don't see anyone walking the sidewalks, and they're not supposed to be unless they have essential business there. Uh, meteorologist Cat Campbell now joining us with a look at the Saturday forecast. Cat, dry right now, but that's going to be different in the morning. It is going to be much different in the morning. Clouds have already started to arrive tonight. Temperatures this weekend in the upper 60s to lower 70s. Rain early tomorrow and then late on Sunday. So I want to stress it is not going to be a washout weekend. If we break down tomorrow's forecast hour by hour, it's much warmer in the morning. Temperatures in the 50s. We do have showers early in the day, maybe a rumble of thunder as well. But once we get past noon tomorrow, we start to dry out and clear out quickly. Temperatures climb in the upper 60s to lower 70s with plenty of sunshine tomorrow afternoon. Back to you. All right, Kat, thank you. We have a saying around here, you can leave WREL, you can move on to greener <laughs> pastures, but you don't really leave. Joining us now is former reporter and current weekend anchor for our Fox affiliate in New York City, Dan Bowens. Hey, Dan, it's Good. great to see you. I know it's bath time and bedtime for your children. <laughs> Thanks for chatting with us. I want to start with life at home. How are you and your family doing with this? How are you handling this being there literally at the epicenter? Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, it's good to hear, hear both of your voices. Um, you know, my wife and I, we have three kids. They're younger kids. I think like a lot of families, millions of families all over the world are just kind of trying to figure it out. My oldest daughter is in kindergarten, so we've got the schooling that we're sort of trying to help her out with. Mostly it's trying to keep her and everyone else away from the screens as much as possible. You just try to keep a little structure for them. It gives, it gives them a little bit of sanity and us a little bit of sanity too while we're, while we're just trying to figure it all out. Dan, the New York City we all know is always bustling, Monday through Sunday, yeah. sun up to sundown. Now it's a ghost town. Now, we see our city streets empty. It's odd, but up there in New York, it has to be especially surreal for you. Yeah, I, I work uh, on the weekends, like you mentioned. So when I drive in and out of the city, there's there's typically not a lot of traffic at night uh, and on the weekends. But even going down through Times Square on a regular night three months ago, there'd be thousands, tens of thousands of people who are there. These days, after I get off my shift on Saturday and Sunday, I drive right down 7th Avenue, right through the heart of Times Square. And I, I swear to you guys, I could stop right next to where the large steps are, right in the heart of Times Square. I could take a selfie and I'd be the only one in there. Every, uh, every weekend you can do that. Every, uh, there are several other uh, parts of the city. Any, any place you go in the city, um, you really are, are a lot of times on your own. Um, it's, 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 it's very strange, absolutely. Dan, I know what it's like for us just being in the newsroom Throughout the day, we're immersed in this. You can't get away from it. Yeah. It's hard to go out and take a break. My gosh, what it must be like to be in New York where the immersion is so different. And you know, my wife and I, we live in New Jersey, uh, so I commute into the city. 
And so here, there are a lot of people who typically would commit commute to the city who are staying at home. Uh, I have a job that's considered an essential worker. So I do go in and work in the city at least three times a week. And sometimes when you're walking through the neighborhood and you're six feet away from somebody and they ask you, are you still working in the city? Uh, you have to say, yeah, you know, that's, it's part of the job. And I'm probably one of two or three people in my whole neighborhood um, who a is interacting with people outside of their own family and let alone going all the way uh, into New York City. So it's something that, you know, you just try to balance the, the safety of it with needing to do the job. And you look around and you see so many other people who just in an instant lost their jobs. Uh, it's certainly something I'm, I'm grateful to still be able to do, uh, even even though the challenges, um, certainly, as you guys know, just being in a newsroom, being in an area where there are other people at this point, it's, it's strange. It's, it's really strange. You can see how, you know, in a couple of weeks, months, there, there will be a lot of things that probably won't go back to normal, at least not right away. Dan, I have a friend in New York who has become infected, but the thing is no, he has no. several other friends who are infected. In fact, many in his cluster, how close yeah. has the virus gotten to you? You know, right down the street from where we live, there was a young father, 41 or 42 years old, and he was infected and he passed away. A younger guy who didn't have any preconditions or, or anything like that. And, you know, you hear something like that and, and it's just shocking. I mean, and, you know, you think about New York, where at the one point it was one person in every thousand people. Then it became one person in every 100 people. And you kind of think about a New York City subway car, where that's one or two people in the subway car that you might be with. And so if one person has it, they'll infect 10 people, and then you get onto the next subway car, and you go into the next place. And New York City is people. New yeah, York City Dan, is yeah. crowds. So uh, it's just kind of kind of non, non-stop there. Sorry to have to stop it there, man. It is yep. so good to see you. Thanks for the time. Stay safe, you and your family. Best to you. We'll see you again yeah. soon. Good Thank luck, you, Dan. guys. I really appreciate having me. All right. The past few episodes of our podcast, How to Commit Journalism, feature interviews with several employees here at WRAL. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining us this week. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you later.